So as you all know, my name is Langston Clark. I'm the founder and organizer of Entrepreneurial Appetite, a series of events dedicated to building community, promoting intellectualism and supporting black businesses. And today I'm excited to bring you this special conversation with Adrian Miller, author of three fantastic books about uh, the history and culture of black cuisine here in the United States. Uh, but I, I, before we get started, I, I wanna mention just, just a few things. One, uh, those of you who are supporters of the show know that uh, recently with two friends of mine who all graduated from North Carolina A&T and HBCU have started an endowment, uh, the From A&T to PhD Endowed Scholarship. So a portion of all the donations and even what is supported by our patrons goes to support that endowment. And I also want to make you aware that I have another podcast that I collaborated to create with two friends of mine, Alvin Logan Jr. and Brandon Crooms, called the African Americans in Sport Pod Class. All of us are sports scholars, and we were raised by the same academic mentor and had to TA the same course in our own various universities. Now we are professors of those courses, and so we've collaborated to bring what we teach in our classes to a broader audience. And now I want to uh, invite Ryan Smith who is the founder and organizer of Black Restaurant Week San Antonio to talk about the things that she's doing here in the Black community in San Antonio and uh, the work that she's doing with her organization. Thank you, good Dr. Clark. Hi, everybody. Um, like I said, my name is Ryan Smith, and I'm the organizer and founder of Black Restaurant Week San Antonio, which is currently happening right now as we speak. It's going on until Sunday. There are over 30 plus um, food trucks, restaurants, culinary businesses, and professionals participating. Um, I started this four years ago with the sole purpose of trying to create a platform and to shine a spotlight on these often overlooked um, businesses and professionals. Um, and it's just been gaining momentum every year. Um, so please go out and support. When you go to one of the participating restaurants, $1 from your purchase goes to the food bank. And then that dollar is also getting doubled by the Tim Duncan Foundation. So altogether that $3 will create, um, will allow the food bank to purchase 21 meals and it's going towards their kids summer program. So with um, Black Restaurant Week, my goal was to, you know, celebrate cuisine, culture and community. So when you go out and you support, that's what you're doing. So thank you so much. Thank you, Ryan. I appreciate all the work that you do here in the community. And now I want to allow uh, our feature speaker, Adrian Miller, to introduce himself before we get started in our conversation about his work as a food historian of Black culture. Yeah, good to be with you all. So I'm Adrian Miller, the Soul Food Scholar. My tagline is dropping knowledge like hot biscuits. We're certainly going to do that tonight. And I'm just grateful to be in this forum. So I was born and raised in Denver, Colorado which probably loses me street cred with anybody who thinks about Southern food and soul food. So the way I went and back is my parents are from the South. My mom's from Chattanooga, Tennessee. My dad's from Helena, Arkansas. So even in an unlikely place like Denver, Colorado, I grew up on these food traditions and, and love them to this day. So um, I'm a lawyer by training, went to Georgetown Law School, went to Stanford undergrad. Uh, then I went to Georgetown Law School, um, practiced law for four years, um, mainly employment law and litigation. Um, worked in the Clinton White House um, for something called the Initiative for One America, came back, worked at a think tank in Colorado, and then I was um, working for Colorado's governor. Um, and lately, for the last nine years, I've been the head of the Colorado Council of Churches, which is a organization that gets, just, gets churches together to do social justice work. And then my side hustle is what we're going to talk about tonight, this writing, uh, this writing career that was so unlikely 20 years ago, because 20 years ago, I thought I was going to be in politics. I thought I would be the Senator from Colorado at this point, um, but took another path. So I think it's interesting that you bring that up because I've heard you speak in preparation for our discussion. I listened to a few other podcasts and I've heard you kind of tell the story of how you went from working in the Clinton White House, being a lawyer. And I think of you as like a pre-millennial because all the millennials now they're like, I got this degree. I don't like my job. And I want to do something else. And so could you just kind of talk about how you were able to make that transition, how you got the courage to do it? Uh, was it something that was difficult to do? And maybe a little bit about your history and policy and the work that you did in the Clinton White House. 
Yeah, so let me just kind of go chronologically. So I'll start with the White House. So uh, President Clinton had this thing called the Initiative on Race. And the wild and crazy idea behind that was that if we just talk to one, other, one another and listen, we might realize that we have more, much more in common than what supposedly divides us. So that was run by um, the late John Hope Franklin, the brilliant scholar, and, and several others. So that went on for about two years. And when that wrapped up, uh, Mr. Franklin and others said, hey, you know, Mr. President, you, you should have an ongoing office in the White House to deal with issues of racial reconciliation. So that and religious reconciliation. So that became the initiative for One America, which is what I worked on. So the idea was just to, first of all, find opportunities to bring leaders of different sectors of our society together and tell them how important it was to be, be One America and see what they could do in their different in the respective um, sectors. So we had faith leaders come to the White House. We had Fortune 500 leadership come to White House. We were working on um, having media people come to the White House, but that one did never came together because President Clinton turned his attention to the Middle East. And so everything else got kind of wiped off the calendar. Um, but the, the, yeah, that was the thing we're doing. And also we were trying to identify what we call opportunity gaps. So these were race-based disparities in access to healthcare, education, credit, capital, those kind of things. So it was really cool. So um, that winds up and I was trying to get back to Denver to start my political career, but the job market was really slow. I was watching a lot of daytime television. I'm not even gonna tell y'all what shows. And in the depth of my depravity, I said, you know, I should read something. So I went to a local bookstore and I'd always like to cook. So I was browsing the cookbook section. And I see this book called Southern Food at Home on the Road in History by a guy named John Edgerton. Great book if you're, I mean, it was written in the late 80s, but a great book if you're interested in Southern food history. And in that book, there's this one sentence where he wrote, the tribute to black achievement in American cookery remains to be written. And I thought, wow, that's really interesting. Even though I was picking up the book 14 years later, I thought, well, I'm sure somebody's already done this, but let me just find out. So I emailed him cold and I asked him, uh, I said, hey, I, I love your book. I read this one sentence, do you still think this is true? He said, yeah, for the most part, nobody's taken on the full story. And there's always room for another. So why not yours? So with no qualifications at all, except for eating a lot of soul food and cooking it some, that's what launched the journey. So, um, you know, I still was thinking in politics. So I did get back to Denver. I got a political job. And um, this was just kind of, I was like a grad student. So in the evenings and on the weekends, that's when I started working on this book. And it was tough because as I told more and more people what I was doing, man, I got a lot of hater aid. Um, you know, some people were saying, you're a Stanford grad. Why are you writing about soul food? Other people are just like, soul food is slave food. I mean, we, we've done a lot to get past that food. Why are you celebrating that? You're, you're, you're literally celebrating white supremacy on a plate. Um, and so all kinds, yeah, just all kinds of negative stuff about soul food. So, you know, I, I, I was passionate about it. I, I was learning a lot, a lot of cool stuff, but, but you know, ultimately, I wanted to create something that I thought people would read. So the question was, you know, am, am I going to put out something that nobody digs? Um, it didn't turn out that way, but that was tough. Mm -hmm. And just, yeah, just, and then, you know, just a lot of skepticism, because there are a lot of people that walk around with a dream saying they're going to do something, and they never do it. So I know I was getting that too. And one of the biggest uh, compliments I get, even to this day, is people say, you know what, I had my doubts, but you actually did it. And I, I, yeah, you're paved away for yourself. You're having a great time. You're going around the world and you really went for it. So I, I'm just really proud of you. So yeah. I, I think, I think you, well, first I, I want to go back because you're from Tennessee and if I'm not mistaken, you're, you said you're from Chattanooga, right? Uh, my mom's from Chattanooga, Tennessee. Yeah. Okay. So my mom is from Chattanooga, Tennessee too. So oh, we might okay. be cousins, but we, we can talk about that later. Um, <laughs> How, how did you how did you become a foodie like what what was like your your food experience growing up what made because i think people love food right and people call themselves foodie and they it's like everybody's calling themselves a foodie but you you write about food so could yeah. you talk about like your journey into like both like your your palate being interested in food but also intellectually being interested in food yeah, so it happened in different stages. So um, my mother, my late mother worked nights. So um, I have a twin sister and a younger brother. I have two older brothers and an older sister, but they were way out of the house by the time we were growing up. And so um, my mom was just too tired. So before school, we had to take turns every week making breakfast for each other. 
So, you know, I made things like scrambled eggs with eggshells, pancakes, French toast, malto meal, cream of wheat, maple, you name it. And so that's where I first learned how to cook. And then I, as I got more confidence, then I would start making, I'd try to give my mother a break on the weekends and make mm -hmm. something. Um, but, you know, it wasn't really a passion. Um, but fast forward in law school as a way to relax, because it was a grind, man. I would just take a time out and I would watch these cooking shows. And they had these gourmet cooking shows on, on the Discovery Channel back then. Discovery Channel was a lot about cooking back then. And I just started watching these shows and I'm seeing these, you know, high class chefs make stuff. And I kept watching. I'm thinking, hmm, I think I can make that. And so that's when I started becoming more of a foodie is from watching the, the chefs do their things on those shows. Um, and that that's plant that planted the seeds that would let later flower when I started really getting into this work. But I think that's when I that's when it first really started capturing my imagination. Yeah. And I, I, oh, I and I'm sorry, I forgot one thing you asked oh, about my palate. So I was blessed, man, because my mom, my late mom was a great cook. Um, so she made food from a lot of different cuisines. And it just pains me because I, I know a lot of people who tell me, yeah, yeah, my parents could not cook. I grew up eating just whack food and that was not my experience at all. At all. So I was, I was really lucky uh, to have a mom who could really cook. And my dad can cook too. He would cook sometimes with my mom. She, she put a foot in it, man. Okay. All right. Um, I want, I want to talk a little bit about the book Soul Food mm -hmm. and I think you kind of hit on the question that I'm about to ask and the, the way that you describe people criticizing why write a book about soul food, that's slave food. And first of all, I just want to know, were those like bougie black people who felt like they were too good for soul food? And like, how does like, because I, I see the importance of like learning like our history about, you know, soul food. And to be honest, there are times where I'm like, yo, that's that's slave food. It's not not good for us. Yeah, um, yeah. So so why why write a book about soul food? Well, one is because um, Edgerton's charge that I talked about earlier, you know, he it was like the definitive history of African-American food. So I, that's what I was going to do, because I reached out to a lot of food writers. They said, look, this country's racist. They've never written about our food or our cooks, so you're just not going to find that much. So cobble together the best book that you could. So I thought it was going to be hard to even do the definitive work, right? But um, you know, there we've been written about a lot, and our cooks have been written about a lot. And after doing some research, especially thanks to the internet, I quickly had enough material to write five books. So I wrote about soul food because I thought, well, this is the most recognizable aspect of African American cuisine. Let me write this book, and if people are feeling it, maybe it will lead to others. So that, that's why I wrote about soul food. Um, and then the, the thing I thought is I noticed in looking through articles and talking to people and all these other things, there, there were two, there, there's a lot of love for soul food, let's just say that. Yeah. But there were two main drum beats of criticism about soul food. One, and we've already named them, right? One is that this is slave food, not worthy of celebration. The other is that, hey, this food needs a warning label. It's going to kill you if you keep eating it. So I, I wanted to sort out fact from fiction hmm. because there's, there's something to those critiques, but I don't think it's the whole story. And I think there's a much complex, a much more comprehensive and complex story that needed to be told. So that, that's why I went down that. So I, I wanted just to see, okay, what's, what's true and what's not. And then the other thing is I was looking at all these other cuisines, right? Um, that are fat laden and all these, are, I'm hmm. like, you're gonna tell me that that food is better than soul food? Uh, so I kept wondering, like every every other culture's food gets celebrated, why not ours? Right. So that's that's really what propelled me. And so you know, the, it was a wide spectrum, man. So I did get the bougie people, um, but then I got on the other end. I got more what I would call um, it was more ideological, right? It was just people like they wanted to decolonize everything about Black life. And so because this narrative about black food being slave food, they're like, yeah, we got to get away from that too. And so their, their energy was more about, well, what, what connects us to Africa, the plant-based diet, which I think is really fuel, fueling a lot of the creativity that we're seeing in the vegan space right now. Um, so it was, it was a whole bunch of people. Um, so I, I got the bougie people and then I, I, I got the really pro-black brothers and sisters that are just like, yeah, this food was not for us. It was for us, but not by us. Right. And um, so, yeah. And again, that that I really wanted to explore fact from fiction. So, talk about why greens is your favorite black dish. 
So greens, one, they're just delicious. Uh, two, they're good for you. And um, I think greens really tells the story of black movement from West Africa to the Americas because um, greens are central to a lot of West African cuisines. And um, the greens that they were used to in West Africa are tropical greens, right? And they're not gonna grow in a temperate climate. And so you see, and they were bitter greens. And so you see, you could see enslaved West Africans coming to a new place, trying to recreate home, not having access to the exact same thing, and then deciding, hey, I'm gonna find a good substitute. And they substituted the bitter greens of Europe. So that's why collard, kale, mustard, turnip, you know, they're all botanically speaking in the same family. They're all bitter greens. And that's that's one of the reasons why they become part of the plate. So to me, greens are just a great metaphor for the, the journey. of ens And it speaks to um, enslaved ingenuity, uh, creativity, and also the ability just to make some delicious stuff. Yeah. And so that's why I like him. And b before we were talking about like the super hardcore black folk that want to decolonize the food, the bougie black people that are saying that that's food is slave food and it's no good for you. And in the chapter about macaroni and cheese, um, there's an interesting conversation with Condoleezza Rice. And I, I think she was on the 700 Club, Pat Robertson show, whatever it was. <laughs> and I think it's interesting, right? Because Black folk aren't all the same. Right. But I think there may be some commonalities, at least in, in the, the African-American story, those of us who come from are the descendants of slaves here in the States that food is, is, a com is a commonality, a, a common thing that we have in our culture that we all share. Um, can, can, is, is there like, should, should, we, should we be looking into food as like a political statement? Like, or should we just enjoy it? Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, I think it's a, it's it's both, right? Hmm. Um, and that's that's been interesting because uh, I've been in spaces where people have fatigue about you know talking about the backstory of food, but I I think we're in a moment now where people actually are really interested in the backstory of food. Um, like you know, people want to know where does this come from? Why are these people eating this? What what is this thing? And I've been fascinated by that as well. Um, and and what you see is when you when you pull a meal together, that's the traditional food of a culture. It tells a lot about their story because it gives you uh, a sense of the environment from which they came because usually the stuff they eat and celebrate was stuff that was ready available and then you also see influences from other cultures right you, you, you can see the after effects of conquest how like some some other people's food wound up on your plate and maybe even those associations got lost yeah. um and you can see the, you know the just the implications of contact and other things and that that all fascinates me so um, I, I think that we should definitely do both. We should definitely enjoy the food, but I think um, there's a moment um, that food creates that you don't get in a lot of places. Like, you know, in our increasingly fractured society, right? There's, there's only a few places, or let me just, there are fewer spaces where we can come, where people from all walks of life can come together. And the table is one of the few left. You know, it may be church, maybe the concert hall, you know, music or arts, entertainment, sports. Um, but the table is one of those. And so I'm really interested in, in seeing, looking um, past the, oh, this is really good uh, observation of food to, and experience of food to say, okay, well, how can food bring us together? Yeah. And, and I, I, think, I think that's important because I'm, I'm an education scholar. And when I was in graduate school, they would always critique multicultural education as being very superficial where all the kids from different cultures would bring their food and they would just they would just share food. And I and I wonder, like based upon what you were saying, I think it's interesting that there's teachable moments in food. And that if there was a way to take a cuisine and break it down and use it to tell the history of a people, that we could enjoy the food, but then also learn a lot about one another and the origins and the story that goes along with it. So I appreciate yeah. that. I had never thought of it in that way. Like I was really very critical of people just sharing food because it's just like you know it's almost <laughs> like entertainment in a way it's just for your enjoyment but when you put it the way you did it's it's it can actually be used to tell a, a deeper story so yeah um, and I'll, I'll give i'll just give you one quick example when i i talk about hibiscus drinks right so in west africa hibiscus is native to west africa and they there are very popular drinks um in french-speaking uh africa it's called um 
this app uh, in Nigeria, it's called Zobo. Um, you know, the, that drink comes to the Americas, gets to Jamaica, it's called Sorrel. And then it starts making its way around Latin America, South America, where it's called Flor de Jamaica, Jamaica flower, or Awa de Jamaica, Jamaica water. And so I, te I tell Latinos, okay, when you go to a taqueria and you get that Awa fresca and you ask for a Jamaica, you're drinking a riff off a West African drink. And their eyes are like, what? I'm like, yeah, yeah. Because I, I remember I was in a talk. It's like, yeah, no, Latinos made that up, man. And I'm like, no, they didn't. This is wow. where they got it from. So. So I'm going to be honest. And I don't, I don't know if this means my black card getting revoked. I, 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 the first time I had hibiscus tea was like at a, at a gentrifying coffee shop in Austin, Texas. Like I thought it was some white stuff, to be <laughs> honest. Well, so did I, man. Yeah, I had a red zinger tea, I think it's called, from Celestial Seasoning. That, that was my first hibiscus tea. Um, but what now, I, knowing the history now, I can look back and I can see all of these red drinks throughout the African-American experience. And I'm like, oh, man, maybe this was just like a, because they couldn't get hibiscus, maybe this was a nod to that. That's why I think red Kool-Aid is the official soul food drink. I think it's a nod. But if you go back through history, you, you see almost at every public African-American gathering, there was some red drink. Uh, the first reported iteration was red lemonade. That was the thing in the 1860s through the 1890s. And then you get carbonated beverages, but usually they were red. And, you know, so there, there's this thing about red drinks. And so I think it's because of the hibiscus and cola drinks of West Africa that came to the Americas. So wait, do we, does that mean we also get credit for pink lemonade? <laughs> it's, it's red. It's basically red. Like when Is you it, red? Well, I don't know. I've had some that's very pink, but yeah, yeah, no, all of that stuff was called circus lemonade. Um, and so it could be varying degrees of pink and red. And it was associated with African-Americans. So in the same way that African-Americans were stereotyped for watermelon and fried chicken, they were stereotyped for red lemonade. And, and, and it's, the, it's crazy, right? Because everybody was drink, eating and drinking it, you know, just like fried chicken and watermelon. Wow. A lot of people were drinking uh, red, some kind of red lemonade, but African-Americans got associated with it and sometimes ridiculed for it. That's interesting. And I, I think, think what's powerful about your books is because they, they, they talk about how black culture is the foundation for American culture, but through the lens of like the culinary arts. And I, I, I also want us, want us to talk a little bit about the book about the president's kitchen cabinet and our role in, in feeding, you know, the leaders of the country and take us from like the antebellum period to, to the Obamas, like what, what, what was that experience? Like what contributions did we make from the, basically the highest seat to like the way, like our food culture has evolved in the United States? Yeah, well, it was really while I was writing the soul food book that I came across a few stories of African Americans who had cooked for our presidents and it wasn't enough to anchor a book so I just after I finished the soul food book I said oh you know what. I'm just gonna look around and see how much I get, and if I get enough then i'll write a book about that. And just through my research alone, which is just scratching the surface because records weren't accurately kept. Um, I found 150 African Americans who have cooked for our presidents from George Washington to the president uh, uh, administration. So there's uh, every president has an African-American cook for them in some capacity, whether it was in the White House kitchen or when they were on a train or a boat or went someplace and stayed for a long period of time, Air Force One, you know, um, they had a had an African-American cooking for them. So um, the early road to the White House kitchen was accidental. You were either the enslaved cook or the private cook of, of a fame, you know, of a person who became president. Um, very few people have had the professional ambition to go to the White House kitchen. Now that's different now, but it's still a lot of like who you know. Um, and so, yeah, the, the White House kitchen, typically you have the executive chef and the pastry chef, and then maybe three or four assistant chefs. So if you were to step back and look at the White House kitchen from over the span of history, the typical White House cook was an African-American woman. It's really, by the time we get to uh, Jackie Kennedy, she starts shifting and reorienting White House food to a, a classical European aesthetic. And then, then the black cooks didn't have that experience. So as they retired or left, uh, you know, classically trained white chefs started getting hired, typically men. And so that's when we start to see the waning influence of black cooks in the White House kitchen is in that, that time period. And I'm not saying it's racist. I'm just saying she had, 
she had a certain taste and she wanted things a certain way and black cooks didn't meet that experience now of course now there's so many black cooks who are classically trained they could do that but in the 1960s and so they did they just didn't have that they were cooks who learned um by experience maybe in hotels and other places so um the the white house today a president can have the white house executive chef handle everything and the current white house chef is a filipina she's been there since the second term of george w bush or they can have they can hire their own private chef to cook just for the family because there's a kitchen on the second floor where the family lives and in modern uh presidential history since 1960 only two presidents have had a private cook at the White House. That was Lyndon Johnson, had a black woman named Zephyr Wright, and then the Obamas. They had a white guy named Sam Cass. So um, it's really, really interesting kind of narrative arc in the White House kitchen. So I'm thinking about when you were talking and you said something about the ambition to become a chef at the White House. And I don't, I don't know if that's even something people think about to aspire to, right? Like, how, so for, for, for younger black folk or people who are, who are hobbyists and cooking, they're foodies, but they like to cook, like what, it, what is the pathway into becoming like a chef for those of us who don't know it? Right, so there's really two ways to do it. One is to go to culinary school. But you know, um, the more I talk to people who've gone to culinary school and people in the restaurant industry, I just think if you want to cook, you just kind of got to start working at restaurants and it's not an easy life, but um, nowadays restaurants are hungry for uh, talent and workers. Uh, so you can, you can get hired and then you just kind of work, work, work. But the other thing that's important is you need to network. Um, so it, it's important to hone your craft and, and to know what you're doing, but you need to belong to chef associations. You need to be out there and let people know about you because seriously, um, it's, a, it's a lot about who you know that uh, if you want to be in the White House, that leads you to that kind of that place. Um, there are kind of two paths to the White House today, the White House kitchen. One is being in the military. So there are a lot of U.S. Navy cooks and in the Navy, they actually have a culinary competition. So if you do that well and you're cooking for admirals and other people, you might get detailed to the White House. So that's one path. Um, but a lot of the White House chefs that are in the White House now, um, they usually have hotel experience because the White House is pretty much run like a, a small boutique hotel. So um, that's one way. So uh, I see someone aspiring to be a pastry chef. You know, um, you don't necessarily have to go to the military, but what I would say is um, get, get work in some kind of pastry shop, learn how to do that. And I think um, one of the things to do is uh, really promote yourself. So have a nice social media following, um, be out there um, and, and belong to pr uh, professional associations. Uh, and hopefully somebody will take notice of you because it's really, it's, it's a lot of it is who you know. So I'm, I'm almost wondering, do governors have chefs too? What about oh, like, yeah. the Supreme Court? Like, what, what oh, about yeah, they all have, yeah. yeah, they all have them. You just don't hear about them. Mm. Um, because, you know, it's just, it's because it's the White House. Um, but yeah, no, a lot of, um, a lot of governors and, and folks have had um, chefs and even the Supreme Court. I really want to write about the Supreme Court chefs, but you talk about a veil of secrecy. You think there's secrecy around the White House, man, trying to get any information about the Supreme Court is just tough. Yeah. I think that would, that would be an interesting book just because we don't, our, our government, we're, I, I think, I don't want to, I don't want to minimize the presidency but we, we negate to think about the other branches. And I think it would be interesting to hear the story of our government through food, um, yeah. whether it be senators, house representatives, you know, Supreme Court, whatever. So here's the interesting thing. Um, there's a lot actually written about congressional cooks because for most of Congress's history, the cooks have been black. And what was really interesting is you had black men running the congressional restaurants in the late 1800s, well, well into the mid 1900s. And we just don't write a lot about them, but um, some very famous people were running the White House kitchen. So there's a guy named George Downing um, and his, his uh, I wanna say his son, uh, he was a famous oyster man in um, New York City who amassed a fortune. His son was running the uh, white, uh, the representative, the house restaurant they called it in Congress for a while. So there's a, there's a rich story there. I have been thinking about writing that. 
Um, that's going to take a lot more research because there's there's information out there, but not as much as we got from the presidents. But there is. But the Supreme Court, for whatever reason, man, people just never they never write about the Supreme Court. The aside from the justices and the decisions, you never hear anything else about the inner workings of the Supreme Court. That, that's pretty interesting. Um, I want to I want to shift a little bit now to your to your most recent book. I'm gonna hold it up. Right. The story of, of black folk in uh, barbecue black smoke and I live in Texas. I'm not I'm not from Texas. I don't like brisket. <laughs> I, I don't like brisket at all. It doesn't taste good to me. Everybody's here is like, yo, we're gonna go get some brisket and it's gonna be fantastic. And it just it's not flavorful to me. Even putting the sauce on afterwards, it just it does not do it for me at all. I don't like brisket and I think I eat it at the cookout or at the barbecue or at the restaurant because everyone else is is eating it. But even wow. like listening to like you speak in other places in preparation for this, it like dawned on me like, I don't like brisket. <laughs> I'm sorry, I went on a tangent, but I just had to share that. Uh, real, no, real. no, that's a trip. Well, I've got some unfortunate news. Um, so the Central Texas barbecue style is now the default barbecue style in the world. Uh, I was just in the Middle East, so I was in Dubai and Cairo. They're opening up Central Texas style barbecue places. And I, I make a point of saying Central Texas because that's the barbecue from the European immigrants that's very beef focused and sausage focused as compared to, compared to East Texas, which is heavily African-American influenced more pork. Um, they certainly have beef and other things, but you know, more pork, more of a Creole influence. But man, that's that's the default. And it's because Texans are just great cheerleaders. Yeah. Because when they when they go someplace, they're like, oh, this is not good. You need to have it the way I have it. And and um the dominance of Texas barbecue has implications now for black restaurateurs because uh if you're let's just say you're a black barbecue restaurant owner in Omaha, Nebraska, um, you've got and you've been doing pork for decades. You now have people coming into your restaurant asking for brisket because they're used to seeing, all they really know about is Central Texas and they wanna see some brisket. So you have a choice as a restaurateur. Do you start putting, you know, smoking brisket and putting it on your menu, even though that's not your experience or do you let that customer walk outside the door? You know, it's, it's tough. The problem is a lot of people are choosing to just make brisket but they're not doing it well, man. There's just a lot of okay brisket and I, I could see you. I, I, if you've had some of the brisket I've had, I, it's almost like roast beef. I could see you saying, yeah, I'm not feeling this. But on the other side of the equation, I've had some slam and brisket, and it's usually a Texan that's make, that makes it. So, so I, I lived in Central Texas. I lived in Austin. And to me, my, my default is that it tastes like roast beef. I, I don't think I have ever had great brisket and i gotta tell you me maybe it's just i don't maybe i just don't like it i don't know i got i gotta tell you i'm surprised for you to say that being in austin if you were some other places i'd, I'd be like okay he's probably missed out but i can't remember the name of that spot um okay it's like the main spot austin everybody like gets it's franklin up. barbecue franklin now franklin's was was good barbecue i only went there once but i don't remember their brisket <laughs> standing out to me you know, I don't know if it was bad, I, but if it was good, it, it would have like, ding, 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 this is the best. If, and it was probably would have been the first risk that I ever had because I went there like my first two weeks in Austin, you know, but it's just, it just doesn't do it for me. Not at all. Not at all. Um, can, can you uh, just talk a little bit about Black folk in like our history and barbecue here in the United States? Um, before we've gotten to this point where we have to now be doing brisket. Yeah, yeah. So, <clears throat> so African Americans, and so my argument, which not everybody agrees with, but I go where the evidence uh, leads me. I, I believe that barbecue is Native American in origin or its foundation, because the this type of cooking and the word barbecue does not exist until people from Europe show up in the Americas and they're like, huh, I've never seen this before. So, um, but that knowledge gets transferred to African Americans. And by the time you get to the late 1600s, African Americans are the go-to cooks in barbecue. And the reason why is um, because barbecue was scalable and it's labor intensive. So we get a lot of stories of these barbecues where, you know, a few hundred people to thousands. 
And that's not possible with other types of cooking. There's a reason why you don't read about fried chicken dinners for 10,000 people in the early 1800s, because that would be a logistical nightmare. But you could make barbecue for 10,000 people, because as long as you have enough land, enough animals, and enough, you know, enough food, and enslaved labor, you can make all this happen, because people did not want to pay. And the racial dynamic of a country is if you want to have a lot of work done and don't pay anybody, you make African Americans do that work. So there are newspaper articles all over the place in the 19th century that basically say, if you're gonna have authentic barbecue, you have to have a Negro man make it. And so blackness, because of slavery, blackness and barbecue get wedded. And the conventional wisdom right now is that barbecue takes shape in Virginia. Those are the earliest accounts that we have of barbecue as we understand it today. And barbecue spreads from Virginia with slavery. So people looking for more opportunities brought their enslaved uh, African Americans with them and guess who was doing the barbecue in the new context. So in your beloved state of Texas, we've got newspaper articles from the 1820s and 30s reporting barbecues, but it was enslaved African Americans doing it. And they were doing barbecue decades before Central European immigrants showed up in the central part of the state. Um, and then don't let's not forget that in the south part of Texas, you've got Latino traditions that go back centuries, uh, different type of barbecue. So um, that so it, it, that is wedded, and then it's not until the end of the twentieth or sorry the nineteenth century that you start to see more and more white men get involved in barbecue. But still, they rely on a black workforce. So in the eighteen nineties and early nineteen hundreds, you get all of these articles celebrating these white guys in barbecue. And whenever there's a picture taken of them or some illustration, they're standing around looking at something and black people are actually doing the work. It's kind of like a modern day construction site, you know, like especially on the road, you like drive by and you usually see some dude just watching everybody while everybody, everybody else is doing the work. That's the case. And this all changes in the 1990s. That's when we see a pivot away from an African-American barbecue aesthetic to a white one. And uh, what happens in the media is that basically they fall madly, deeply, softly, tenderly, however you want to describe it, in love with white dudes. And it's usually four white dudes. It's usually the Bubba type, you know, the working class white guy. Then you've got the competition um, barbecue circuit guy. You've got the urban hipster, you know, interesting facial hair, glasses, piercings, tattoos, maybe skinny jeans, but that doesn't happen a lot in barbecue. And then you've got the fine dining chefs who are in barbecue in ways they were never before. So, all of a sudden in the 1990s, Bobby Flay is, is the go-to barbecue guy on the Food Network. He's a fine dining chef, but nobody's um, taking a sneeze, a sneeze at that now, or sneeze at that now. And most fine dining chefs will tell you that they feel like they have to have some barbecue cred. So we've seen a complete reversal um, of where African American of African American status in barbecue, even though African Americans shaped much of what we call barbecue today. So Black Smoke is a celebration of African-American barbecue culture and a restoration of African-Americans to the barbecue narrative. Wow. I have, I'm worried. And I'm worried because, you know, COVID was bad for a lot of restaurants. And we know that, that black owned businesses have their troubles. And with, what I think you just described as the appropriation of black food culture, black culinary art, and maybe some black businesses, some black restaurants going out of business. Is is barbecue going the way of like jazz? We got a jazz restaurant here in San Antonio, and we there's like no black artists there. I, it's good jazz. I'm not hating on it, but like the white lady that goes up there and, and sings, she sounds like a black lady singing jazz. Like if I wasn't Watch, watching it, I would think it was like a smooth black lady up there. So I, I'm worried, are, are there concerns that we should have about the preservation of, of our culture and our presence in barbecue? Like how, how do we preserve our presence and our, our centrality to barbecue culture? Yeah, well, you know, that's one of the reasons why I wrote this book is to make sure that these stories get preserved. And, um, you know, I can't take credit for all of this, but we're, we're seeing a, a change. You're starting to see more people getting uh, African Americans getting inducted to barbecue halls of fame. There are various ones around the country. Um, more African Americans are getting cookbook deals. Um, Rodney Scott, um, barbe whole hog barbecue guy out of Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, a couple of months before my book came out, his book came out. And uh, he was the first African American barbecue professional 
to have a cookbook published by a major commercial publisher in 30 years. So now think about all the books and barbecue that have come out in 30 years and you haven't had one brother or sister author one, you know, get a, a book deal. Well, what's up with that? Um, and then you're seeing more African-Americans on these TV shows. Because I, I seriously, in the late, like from 2006 to 2015, I want to say, I can't tell you how many barbecue shows I watched purporting to be, you know, a national barbecue show. And there was not one black person on that show. And I'm just thinking, I'm just sitting there. And uh, here's, here's the best example. 2004, I'm watching the Food Network and there was Paula Deen's Southern Barbecue. Yeah. And I, I watched it because I thought, well, you know, I can, I'm, I'll just find out the latest in barbecue and see who are the leading lights and, you know, all that stuff. 60 minutes later, when the credits are rolling, no black person was featured on that show. So I thought, well, how does this happen? And then I thought, well, maybe I got it twisted. Maybe it was Paula Deen's Scandinavian Barbecue and I just wasn't paying attention mm -hmm. to the commercial, right? Um, but then I found out it was not just her show. It was endemic of uh, so many other things, newspaper articles, other TV shows. Um, it was messed up, man. So we got a ways to go, but I think it's, it, it's, we're making some progress. So it's up to us who like African-American barbecue to be cheerleaders and to say, well, you know, when somebody comes around the corner talking about Central Texas or whatever, you know, um, there's certainly African-Americans who make that type of barbecue, but you know, you have to say, well, hold on, hold on. I like my barbecue with sauce on it. That doesn't mean it's bad barbecue. It's just different barbecue. Yeah. Um, because the, the shift away from African-American barbecue aesthetic has redefined what barbecue is. So now there are people walking around and saying that barbecue should not have sauce. And in the African-American community, sauce is like a calling card. That's I mean, I tell people, I've been to restaurants where I got served my barbecue and it was a pool. It was like a plate with an ocean of sauce and little islands of meat poking through, right? That's how proud people were of their sauce. Um, and you've got people saying like, oh, no, a, a spare rib shouldn't have a rib tip attached. You know, all of these things that are part of African-American barbecue are now, when I post a picture on social media, I got people saying that's not real barbecue or that doesn't even look good. Look at all that sauce. You know, maybe that's why I, in all, in all honesty, like I don't like Texas barbecue. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't like it because it, it my introduction to it was Central Texas. Okay. And there's no sauce. And the way the way I grew up, I'm from the Northeast, but like my barbecue always has sauce. And I just I don't like it. <laughs> and I think I just I think I just really realized that in this conversation with you right now. Okay. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad we <laughs> I'm glad we brought a moment of clarity. Um, I, I've had some good stuff in Central Texas um, and uh, throughout Texas. So, you know, may, maybe I can show you some spots. I hope so. Because <laughs> I, I, I just, I, honestly, I think it's, it's, just, it's just my taste. I think it's just my palate. That, that style of barbecue just isn't for me. Like, I don't like all the onions and, and the pickles <laughs> and all that stuff on the side. I didn't know what to do with it. Do I yeah, put yeah. it on the pulled pork sandwich? Is it on the side? Do I mix it with the brisket? Do I dip it in the sauce? Like, I didn't know what to do with it. it it's, just, it's just different from what from what I was used to and what I was raised with. You know, it's just, just not the same. Um, can you, there, there, there's a part in the book that talks about the black church and barbecue. Um, but before we get there, well, maybe it'd be part of, part of you answering the question. Can, can you talk about your relationship to the Black church and the Black church relationship with, with barbecue and maybe with food in general? Well, I'm a person of faith. I'm part of the African Methodist Episcopal uh, faith tradition. So I still go to the church that I grew up in, um, the same church where my parents met. And, uh, you know, um, the church has been a very important part of my life. Um, it grieves me when I when I hear so many people who have been damaged by church and are broken because of church, because that just wasn't my experience. But I, I know that's happened. And that makes me sad because I think there's a, a beautiful mystery to to religion. Um, and I, I grew up in a nurturing community. I know that I'm successful because so many of the adults, even though I wasn't their child, they were invested in my success and it would, you know, very encouraging and would tell me how much they uh, were rooting for me. And so, you know, there are these, not only do you get your spiritual uh, food at a church, but you, you also get um, social life nurtured at your church. And um, in the rural South and also in urban areas, the, the church has been an important part of African-American social life. 
And so um, we had some really important feasts during the, during the year. And so I just remember that church food and however I was proud of their certain dish and, and certain people had a reputation for that. And you see that with barbecue. So in the, in the 1700s, there are two people who really figure out that barbecue can build community. And th those were preachers and politicians. And so we read about all of these large gatherings fueled by barbecue, because back then, you know, there's no refrigeration. You weren't taking leftovers and eating them later. And so when you when you kill a pig, man, that's a lot of food. And so, you know, you, you need a community just to eat that food. And so what we found is that um, a barbecue was a kind of a part of spiritual life in the social aspect. So after some spiritual practice was done, people would have barbecue as a way of reinforcing social ties. And barbecue was on the plantation, barbecue was something that was had when the work schedule slowed on weekends, or if it was a special occasion, like the laying by of the crops, the um, harvest, you know, Christmas, um, barbecue would be a part of that. So um, it, it made sense that it was an important part of building community. And, you know, I always make jokes about uh, the faith dimension of barbecue. Like, you know, I tell people whenever I read the Bible and I see any reference to burnt offerings, I start thinking about barbecue and my mind starts to wander. So maybe I need counseling. No, I, actually, I kind of thought that too. Because I'm like, because sometimes I think like they burnt the food. It had to smell good when they were burning it. You know what I mean? Like it says in the Bible, it's a sweet aroma in God's nostrils or something like that. So it had to smell good to them too. Yeah, you know? exactly. Um, what I, what I, I, I want to do now is I want to give people in the audience, uh, the opportunity to ask a question and you can type it in the chat, or, um, if you want to ask it out loud, if you use the raise your hand function, I'll unmute you and I'll give you the opportunity to ask your question to Adrian. Um, but to give you all some time to set that up, I'm going to ask a question and, uh, while Adrian is answering, you all can type your answer in the chat or you can raise your hand and it will get to you afterwards. So it is Women's History Month, and I'm wondering if you could share with us the contributions of Black women in particular, and what are Black women doing now in Black food culture that, that you're noticing? Oh, well, you know, um, Black women have been integral to African-American foodways um, uh, throughout. Um, so one of the joys of my work has been pulling out anecdotes of these amazing women in, what, in, in the ways that they've served. So I, you know, I talked about White House chefs, how the typical White House cook was a, a black woman. And I think about Zephyr Wright, who was the private cook for Lyndon Johnson and how he used her Jim Crow experiences to lobby for the 1964 Civil Rights Act. And when he signed the bill, he gave her one of the pens and said, you deserve this as much as anyone. And then I also think about in my barbecue book, a woman named Marie John, Mary John or Marie Jean um, in French, and she was born in, in Arkansas when it was French territory. And um, she was a pit master. So we have a newspaper article about her superintending a barbecue in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, July 4th, 1840. Um, so, you know, it just shows you as much as barbecue is presented as dude food, we've had black women in the barbecue game for a long, long time. And so in today's space, you know, you're seeing more and more women getting um, decorated um, by, organizations like the James Beard Foundation um, for being named outstanding chefs. We've got uh, people like Jessica B. Harris, <clears throat> excuse me, who wrote books and was the driving force behind uh, High on the Hog, the Netflix uh, smash a television show about African-American food. You've got people like Tony Tipton Martin, who's out there chronicling um, you know, through her work in the Jemima Code um, and also Jubilee. She's doing a lot to enhance our food ways. You've got somebody like Dr. Lenny Sorensen, who's an interpreter. Uh, she was on Netflix making a mac and cheese in, in the milk. A lot of people remember that. But, um, you know, you, so, and you've got a lot of academics like, um, you know, um, Psyche Forson Wilson Williams, um, about talking about black women and fried chicken. And uh, yeah, there's just a lot of people out there doing their thing. So in writing, chefing, um, media. Um, I, I'm excited for what will unfold. And um, I, I see a lot of cutting edge um, leadership from women um, in the food space. So um, I hope that more and more people will support these Black creatives as they do their thing. So we have here in San Antonio a barbecue joint that's actually down the street from where I live. 
called Big Bid Barbecue. And the the woman who is the, the pit master, the head barbecue, head chef, I don't know what the term is, but you know what I'm trying to say. She's in charge of cooking the barbecue. She's like four foot 10. And she is like the pit master. She runs, she runs the show. And um, for those of you who are listening, Ryan and I were hoping to bring Adrian here in person, but it just didn't work out. And so what we wanted to do was have you in conversation with her about, about barbecue and like, you know, I, I think, I just think it would have been, would have been a, a, a great, a great conversation. So, uh, thank, thank you for sharing that. Uh, we don't have any questions in the chat, so I'm, I am sure that people up, oh, we got one hand raised. So Chris, I'm going to, um, I'm going to go to you and I'm going to allow you to talk and then you can ask your question. And then if anybody else wants to ask their question, they can do the same thing. So Chris, here we go. Okay. Hey, uh, how's it going? Uh, this great talk. I really enjoyed that. Um, you know, I found it kind of fascinating. I do have one question um, as a, you know, fellow Southerner raised up in North Carolina with uh, the barbecue and, and soul food and stuff of this nature. Has anyone ever looked into the, the kind of practical aspects of soul food um, in regards to like food safety? Because um, you know, kind of like you mentioned, back in the day, you didn't have uh, a lot of refrigeration. This food was out in the heat, but you rarely heard of food poisoning. Mm. Um, and if you think about it, I mean, like, you know, a lot of the food is salted, it's sugar and stuff of this nature, which would make, I would think, would make it a little less susceptible to, um, you know, growing the organisms that you need for food poisoning. And I didn't know if there was anyone that ever taken a look into that or uh, to see what was going on there. Uh, thanks, Chris. That's an interesting. I, you know, I look through thousands of stuff and I, I can't remember anybody who's, who's looked at that in a systematic way. Mm -hmm. So, uh, hey, uh, you might have a book idea there. Um, I, I just don't know of anybody who's done that. So thanks for the question. I, you know, of course, there, there were newspaper articles here and there about food poisonings, but it wasn't, um, it was not something that was commonplace, at least with our food. You know, because you, you heard about the Food and Drug Administ Act and all that stuff that at the turn of the 20th century. Um, but that's really interesting. I just don't remember seeing a lot of articles in the Black newspapers about food poisoning. I think <clears throat> there was certainly um, a feeling like people were getting poorer quality food. And it, it, just as an aside, so you had, you had a, a, a number of people um, who would actually go shop in the Jewish neighborhoods and they would shop at kosher, at the Jewish uh, butchers because they knew that kosher meat was going to be high quality because um, they were tired of getting ripped off or given lesser quality meat by unscrupulous um, merchants. So things like that. Wow. Yeah. So I um, want to give, again, you all an opportunity to ask a question. But if not, I'll go ahead and ask the, the final question before we go for this evening. What what books are you reading? Because we are a book club. What books are you reading um, that you would like to share with us today? It could be a cookbook too. So, yeah. Um, well, the one I would, if you haven't read it, one that I highly recommend is Edna Lewis's "The Taste of Country Cooking," written in 1976. Edna Lewis is no longer with us, but she's one of the just brightest stars in Southern cooking. And it's an interesting cookbook because it's seasonal. And so she just takes you through a year in the life of this uh, community in Virginia that was formed by, uh, that was founded by the descendants of an, an formerly enslaved people. Um, and it's very literary cookbook. So it's just one that I love to read. So I would highly encourage uh, folks to check out that book. And it's, it's, a, it's still in print. Um, it, I think it was its 30th, yeah. So 2016 was the 30th year. No, that's not right. No, 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 no. Anyway. Yeah, wow, my numbers are off. But anyway, it was a significant um, anniversary for that book. So that's, that's a great book. That's one I highly, and I think once you get Edna Lewis's books, you'll like her other ones like um, Pursuit of Flavor and The Gift of Southern Cooking, um, all great books. Thank you. So Adrian, we appreciate your time. Thank you for being generous with us. Uh, everybody, please make sure that you go out and get all three of his books. 
Um, you can keep them for yourself. You can gift them to other people. There are recipes in each of them. And just remember that our, our food tells a story about our history and our culture. And Adrian, thank you for taking the time to uh, share with us this evening. Yeah, so great to be with you. Thank you so much, Langston. Thank you. So the rest of you all, Adrian, you are free to go. I'm going to take some time with the, the guests and kind of set them up for what we're going to be talking about the next time. So I just ask that the rest of you stay with us just so I can give you a preview about what we're going to have coming up next. So all right. All right. I'll have that up. Yep. Thank you, Adrian. Yep. Peace. All right. So y'all give me a chance just to set things up. And I'm going to share my screen so that we can get started there. And uh oh, okay. All right, so maybe I can't share my screen. So I got a new computer, so I'm not able to share my screen right now. I have to set up the Zoom settings. So I'll just tell you all what we have coming up and I'll send an email out about um, our next, next episode of Entrepreneur Appetite. We're having a conversation with, um, we're having a conversation with Dr. Matthew Clare, who is a professor at Stanford University and Patrice Salton, who is a lawyer and founder of the DC Justice Labs. Uh, Dr. Clare is also the author of Privilege and Punishment. And so uh, Patrice is gonna be talking with him about the criminal justice system and how it affects black folks in terms of race and class. And when we do conversations like that and partnering with uh, Ryan, for example, with Black Restaurant Week San Antonio or the DC Justice Labs with Patrice, we do take a, a portion of the proceeds in addition to supporting the endowment that I started. We also support their organizations as we wanna help uplift black, uh, black founded organizations, whether they be for profit or nonprofit. So I thank you all for joining us here today. I also want to add that if you want to be a regular supporter of Entrepreneurial Appetite and get access to all of our conversations, uh, we do have a patron website uh, where you can support us for $5 a month and you'll get access to each of our monthly conversations. And like always, a percentage of those contributions goes to support uh, the work that we do with providing educational opportunities to our endowment at North Carolina A&T. So thank you all for joining us here today. Uh, have a good evening, stay safe, and enjoy some Black East Texas barbecue when you get a chance. Thank you.